Hello everyone, back to you to Gas Web. It's on your August Bank Holiday Monday, so I'm going to do another historic web video for this uh, late summer Bank Holiday Monday. Uh, for this historic web video, we're looking at the autumn and winter of 1938-1939. And that may seem quite an obscure choice. I've been saying this in videos over the past few days when I've been plugging this historic web video. You may be wondering why we've chosen 1938-1939. There's a couple of reasons we've chosen to do it. Primarily, it has a fantastic white Christmas. But there's a much wider point at work here, and it will become apparent as we go along in the video. So thanks so much for tuning in to this historic web video on your bank holiday Monday. It's wonderful weather out there, so uh, it always blows me away, but particularly on a lovely bank holiday Monday like we've got here in uh, at the end of August 2019. Uh, it always blows me away that people are willing to spend some time with us uh, watching these historic web videos on your uh, precious Bank Holiday Monday. So thanks so much to everybody uh, for tuning in and for doing that. I hope we can make the video uh, entertaining for you. I just say that Terry Scully's autumn forecast will be coming up at Gazovis later this afternoon. I'll probably get that up sometime around 5 o'clock this evening, perhaps maybe a little bit later, but Terry's autumn forecast is on the way uh, today. I've got to say a big thank you to WebCentral.de, uh, where the historic archive of charts are coming from that you're going to see in this video, and also to Trevor Harley, where all of the information uh, that you hear in this video uh, has come from as well. So as I always ex explain with these historic web videos, I'm sort of the smallest uh, part of it. I'm just kind of like a narrator uh, telling the story. But what really makes these historic web videos work, I think, is the information that we get from Trevor Harvey's uh, personal web website, coupled with the historic archive of charts from wetterzentral.d. And when we bring that together, then I think we come away with a, a pretty interesting uh, video. So thanks so much to West Central. Thanks so much to... Uh, uh, Trevor Harley and thanks so much to, for you for tuning in on your uh, late summer back Holly Monday and without further ado we we'll get on with the video so we're going to start on the first day of uh, September 1938 now all you have to go on with this one is that Trevor Harley writes that it's quite warm but cloudy, wetter in the east than in the west. 28 Celsius, uh, 82 Fahrenheit is achieved at South End. On the 12th, has a century temperature of 13.8. And that is all we have to go on uh, with this month, September 19. Uh, 38. So the further back we go, the, the less information there tends to be. So it, it does make my job a little bit harder when we go back uh, a long time. But there we go. We'll see what, ha what was happening in September 1938. Now, just say about the broader picture, the broader issue with this part of the 20th century is that really since 1895, the UK had had a warming trend. So there have been cold winters uh, between 1895 and the end of the 1930s. There have been, for example, we did the historic weather video about the severe um, winter during the Great War, World War I, um, in 1917. There was also another uh, pretty cold winter in 1928-1929. There was an excellent white Christmas uh, in December 1927. Christmas 1927 was a really good white Christmas. So cold interviews had occurred during this sort of 40, 45 year period, but not that many of them. And generally, most of the winters through the first 40 years of the 20th century were mild. You have to go back to 1895 for the sort of last severe winter before 1940. What's interesting about this winter is that it's coming to the end of that uh, very warm, prolonged, pronounced warm spell through the first 40 years of the 20th century. And I always think that nature kind of gives us a little bit of a clue, a little bit of a heads up, a little bit of a hint uh, that things are amiss within the atmosphere before you get to the main Event. So perhaps a good example of this would be uh, the snow that we had in the UK during uh, February 2008, um, February 2009, I should say, during the winter of 2008-2009. wasn't a particularly cold winter overall that winter, but we did have quite a pronounced cold snap. And that was a bit of a heads up about what was going to happen in the following winters 
uh, 09 10 and of course for December remember in December 2010 so I think the nature I think nature and the weather does give us these little hints that things are amiss and this is kind of like a teaser winter and uh, that's why we've or one of the main reasons why we've included it in this video this is uh, a classic teaser autumn winter so we're at, on the Thursday of September 1938 I've explained we haven't got much to go on let's see what the charts were doing uh, so we begin quite showery. There's a bit of a showery trough across the country uh, in early September 1938. These little shallow areas of low pressure moving in from the northwest, probably bringing relatively cool and showery conditions. But by taking it through to the 10th of September 1938, actually high pressure is extending in from off the Azores uh, high, from the Azores high, the Atlantic ridge is building in, bringing no doubt a lot of dry fine and pretty warm weather that high pressure stays with us or the reach stays with us up to the 12th of september 1938 but it begins to weaken a little bit as we get through to the 14th of september the reach starts to drift a bit further southwards we begin to let in more of an atlantic influence that's middle of september 1938 15th high pressures out to our west and we're bringing in this uh, north northwesterly flow but we're bringing showers to northern western parts of the country and probably quite cool as well the ridge then topples in over the country ahead of this area of low pressure. And then we go into the most unsettled spell of the month, I think, as we get through to the 17th. Low pressure is heading in from off the Atlantic. And this gives us quite a spell of wet and windy weather from the 17th through to the 18th. This is classic sort of autumnal conditions. Up to the 21st of September, we've got high pressure building over Scandinavia and low pressure is out in the Atlantic. Bring in weather systems off the Atlantic, so quite a bit of rain coming in with these weather systems. It's fairly mild, though. The wind coming up from the south, so it will be relatively warm. And we actually accentuate that southerly wind as we get through to the 24th of September, 1938, with low pressure out to our west, high pressure to our east, drawing up quite a long fetch uh, southerly wind. There's the upper air temperatures for the 24th of September 1938. And they do look very warm, actually. We've got the 10 cells ice firm pumping north. So I reckon that will probably be enough, depending on sunshine, but probably enough to get temperatures at least to the low 20s. Maybe even you wouldn't rule out mid 20s Celsius uh, with that. There is a weather front, though, it's out to the west. That will bring quite a bit of rain to the northern and western part of the country. And as we go through to the closing days of September 1938, it gradually starts to turn uh, more unsettled from the west. So that's how we finish up on the 30th of September. Uh, last day of the month uh, has low pressure sitting uh, almost over top of the country, centred over Ireland. The temperatures are pretty cool with that as well, so showers or long spells rain. As I say, this is a very average sort of September from a temperature perspective. CT 13.8, nothing uh, particularly exciting from a temperature pers perspective. It is a rather, as we've established, changeable type month. That takes us through to October 1938. Now, this is a much more interesting month. It has a century in temperature, but again, it's very close to average at 10.5. Nothing particularly exciting about that. But uh, Trevor Harley writes that it was very wet and windy at the beginning of the month. 80 millimetres of rain at uh, Hawk's Head Hill in Cumbria on the 2nd. On the 3rd, much of the north and west has over 25 millimetres with 50 millimetres of rain, 2 inches widespread. And some places in the Lake District uh, and South Wales recording 125 millimetres. So very, very wet start to October 1938. So these areas of low pressure heading from off the Atlantic. Looks pretty stormy there, doesn't it? On the 3rd of October 1938, with a 985 millibar area of low pressure to the north of Scotland, bringing in these strong to gale force winds. But if you think that is stormy, wait until you see what happens on the 4th of October. Look at that. Very, very deep area of low pressure at 960 millibars. Um, that would be impressive right in the middle of, the uh, middle of winter, but to get that on the 4th of October, that is very extreme. And look how tight that the isobars are, really gale force winds. I'm not sure if there's tropical elements within that. I think there must be. Below on the 1st of October is uh, sort of around there, I think. 
but let's just highlight it. On the 1st of October, that low is around there, close to Newfoundland, actually. So I think that's got tropical elements uh, within it, that low pressure. Look how it comes across the Atlantic on the 2nd. There it is on the 3rd. We're already wet and windy from this low pressure on the 3rd, uh, but this is the one that's got the tropical elements within it. And on the, on the 4th of October, it just absolutely explodes into that incredibly deep area of low pressure. Trevor Harley writes that the 4th of October was particularly stormy as a deep depression with a low pressure of 953 millibars. It's actually lower than, I thought, 953 millibars, and it's incredibly low for October. Moved northeast across Scotland with severe and widespread gales over central Britain causing widespread damage. Uh, the maximum gust was 104 miles per hour, uh, and there was also a 95 mile per hour gust at Bidston, which apparently is uh, in Merseyside, I think. Uh, Bidston, Merseyside, where there was a mean uh, wind speed of 64 miles per hour that was recorded, and 92 miles per hour uh, wind speed was recorded at Barton in Manchester. So particularly through that central part of the country, Central Island over the Irish Sea into sort of northern England, northwest Wales, probably through the Midlands in towards Lincolnshire, incredibly strong winds. But even in the far south and southwest, it does look like it was a really, really uh, stormy day. So that low pressure scoots away up to our northeast on the 5th of October, leaves us in a classic sort of wet and windy spell of weather, and we go through the rest of the first week of October looking very, very unsettled indeed. That gets to the 8th of October, still driving in the westerly, so still looking uh, pretty unsettled to say the least. That's up to the 10th of October again. Uh, we're looking uh, pretty unsettled there. Trevor Harley says that more heavy rain fell on the 6th, the 8th and the 12th of uh, October 1938. There was 130 millimetres uh, in Cumbria. Uh, and f uh, from the 2nd to the 12th, uh, somewhere else in Cumbria recorded 475 millimetres of rain just in 10 days up in Cumbria. Absolutely incredible and phenomenal rainfall through the first half of uh, October, or the first 10 days, I suppose, 10 to 12 days of October, 1938. Now, things begin to change on the 12th. We start to get some high pressure building to our south. We start to draw up this long fetch southwesterly wind, and it starts to turn much, much warmer as we get through to the 13th. We actually have a maximum temperature of 21 degrees, 70 Fahrenheit recorded, at Colwyn Bay, uh, with these balmy, long, thick southwest winds dragging up the air uh, from the Azores. Up to the middle of October, uh, the rain is generally quite dry and very mild down across southern parts of uh, the country. does look as though it's rather unsettled out to the north and west. And inevitably, for such an unsettled changeable month, by the 17th of October 1938, we're beginning to drive low pressure back in from off the Atlantic. However, the uh, ridge from the south has another go at building. On the, 20, return, on the 20th, returning us to drier and warmer conditions. And then on the 22nd, this is quite interesting, the high pressure tries to get itself up towards Scandinavia. Maybe a hint of what's going to happen in a month or two's time. But at this point, uh, the attempt at the Scandinavian high actually fails as the Atlantic is just too active. We keep these areas of low pressure driving in, bringing further wet and windy weather to the north and west, although quite a bit of dry weather still probably down across the south. So after this very stormy and unsettled opening week to 10 days of October, actually for England and Wales, probably a reasonably dry, prolonged dry spell there for a couple of weeks. Before we get towards month's end and it begins to turn more unsettled, low pressure starts to drop in from the uh, Atlantic, and we begin to return to much more unsettled conditions. That's how we finish up on Halloween 1938, and we do look uh, quite unsettled there. So that takes us through to November. 
1938. Now, this is a pretty remarkable month uh, as well. This has a central temperature of 9.4 degrees. Now, uh, there have been warmer Novembers than that in more recent times, particularly thinking of 1994, uh, which had a November CET of over 10 degrees Celsius. But this is definitely one of the warmest Novembers uh, on record. No getting about, getting uh, away from that. Trevor Harley writes, a very warm month, 9.4 central England temperature, and until recently, the warmest of the 20 century. Uh, temperatures exceeded 21 degrees 70 Fahrenheit in many places across Kent and East Anglia on the on the 5th of November, bonfire night, uh, due to a combination of sunshine and very warm southwesterly airflow originating from the Azores. It's 21.1 degrees in uh, London, Chelmsford and Cambridge, marking the record highest November temperatures for England. So we begin uh, this remarkably warm uh, November of 1938 on a very unsettled note. Low pressure is driving in from off the Atlantic. And uh, that takes us to the third and then through to the fourth. Well, here comes those long fetch southwesters. So we've got the ridge building across central, southern and southwestern parts of Europe. We've got the low pressure out to northwest Scotland. And that is pumping up those long fetch southwesterly winds. And the, on the 5th of November, Bonfire Night, 1938, of course, back then we celebrated Bonfire Night much more so than Halloween. Uh, so we have the high pressure building across France, Spain and down into Mediterranean. Low pressure is being pushed further northwest with a jet stream. And that really does start to pump up those uh, long fetch southwest winds. Look how warm the upper air temperatures are. This is why we get the temperature up to 21 degrees. We get temperature to 70 Fahrenheit. This is classic Indian summer, by the way. A lot of people talk about Indian summer as being... Uh, as when it gets very warm in September. No, that's not right. Indian summer is when you get the warmth in October and even in November, typically after you've had uh, the first frost of the season. So that's how things look on the 6th of November 1938. Remarkably warm, high pressure covering France, Spain and down into North Africa. Low pressure is out to the northwest. Plus we're pumping up that warmth from that warmth from uh, the southwest. A little bit more uh, information. So 20 degrees was recorded around this time as far north as Doncaster and as far west as Colwyn Bay. This was one of two November days this century that exceeded. 70 Fahrenheit. The other one, interestingly, was in November 1946. So maybe there's a connection between uh, cold winters and uh, very warm days in November. Who knows? Um, this is the later of the two, though. So the one that happened in 1946 happened uh, earlier in the month. I think that's around the 1st or the 2nd of uh, November. So this is a truly remarkable uh, November heat wave that we have here in 1938. Look how far uh, northwards that 10 Celsius ice firm is getting. It stretches all the way down to the tropical Atlantic and it's moving northwards into England and Wales. Remarkably warm uh, through the first week of November 1938. I wonder what the CET was for that first week of the month. That's the eighth again. Upper air temperatures looking remarkably warm. Now, on the 10th, the wind starts to swing into the south. High pressure is beginning to move up towards eastern parts of Europe. Low pressure is deepening in the Atlantic. That forces up these uh, southerly winds. And uh, it's starting a little bit more unsettled then. So it's relatively dry and very warm, probably away from northwest Scotland, where it would have been wetter. But generally, it's very dry and very warm through the first week to 10 days of November 1938. Now it starts to turn more unsettled. We draw up the south west winds which would be bringing bands of really heavy rain look at that long fetch southwesterly on the 13th of november still the air is pumping up from the tropical atlantic but now it's a much more unsettled uh, air mass so you see how tight back the isobars are that's gale force winds lashing much of the country and no doubt will be a very active weather front through the central swathe of the country bringing more copious amounts of rain but the upper air temperatures remain remarkably warm again again on the 13th of November 1938. Heading into the middle part of the month, we gradually begin to break this ridge down as the low pressures start to deepen 
in the Atlantic. We gradually begin to break the high pressure down, I should say, as the low pressures start to deepen in the Atlantic. That's the 21st of November 1938. And now it's beginning to turn much more unsettled. The jet stream starting to move south as well. So it's beginning to cool down a little bit. Still probably mild. The air's driving it off the Atlantic, but certainly nowhere near as mild as it was through the first half of the month. And these areas of low pressure are deepening and bringing increasingly unsettled uh, weather. Trevor Harley writes, there was a notable storm on the 23rd of November 1938. Severe gales in the south with a gust of 109 miles per hour at Pembroke. This deepening area of low pressure just here swinging from the Atlantic develops into a major system. There it is. On the, uh, that's where it was on the 23rd of November 1938, just to the southwest of Ireland. That's where it is uh, at midnight on the 24th of November. So obviously it's pushed in across the country. The most tight packed ice bars are on the southern side of the low. That brings severe gales with that uh, 109 mile per hour gust at Pembroke. So now we're much more unsettled. We're much stormier uh, through the second half of November uh, 1938. The 25th was the wettest day of the year. Uh, of 1938 in London, uh, there was 40 millimetres of rain on this day, 25th of November 1938 at Wimbledon. Um, it's very unsettled at times, stormy weather then carries us through to the end of November 1938, more low pressure driving in off the Atlantic, bringing plenty of wet and windy weather. And with that, we're going to pause the video, have a little bit of a break. And when we return, we're going to talk about uh, the winter of 1938-1939, uh, which does include... We haven't seen much in way of cold weather up to now, but I can assure you it will get much more interesting after the break from a cold perspective as we get to Christmas 1938 winter is going to be unleashed and we will talk about that in the second half of the video get yourself a cup of tea get yourself a couple of biscuits and uh, we'll meet back here in uh, around two seconds time so see you very soon okay we're back and we are ready to resume our look at the autumn and now the winter of 1938-1939. So in the first part of the video, we talked about the autumn of 1938. Now we're going to move on, have a look at the winter of 1938-1939. This winter is pretty much the prelude to a change of, uh, of the weather that began in the winter of 1939-1940. But you could probably say the change actually started in this winter. This was the beginning of the change. And by the time we get through to winter 1939-1940, which is our first severely cold winter for 45 years, uh, we go off into a much colder period of weather, colder winters that carries us through the 1940s and probably even some degree into 1950s and also the cold decade of the 1960s. So after around 45 years of increasingly warm weather, we go into kind of like a 30 year period uh, from 1940 to uh, the end of 1960s. That's uh, much colder in terms of the winter and does include at least a couple of very, very severe winters uh, or more. So this winter, 38, 39, is very important from a historical perspective. We don't really remember it greatly as a cold winter because it's not a particularly cold winter in its own terms. But it does have the first signs of the change that's coming. So I've talked enough about the setup. Let's get on with it. I'm going to start here on the 1st of December 1938 and uh, this uh, month, September 1938, has a central temperature of 4.4. So there's nothing particularly remarkable about it from a CT perspective. And Trevor Harley writes very mild uh, at the beginning and at the end, uh, but with a notable snowy cold spell around Christmas. In the first half of the month, 10 to 13 degree temperatures uh, were common and nights were largely frost free, although a change and although a change was forecast uh, to occur later in the month, the magnitude of that change uh, was definitely not. 
So let's see what happens. We find we begin December 9.38, wet and windy. The pattern from November continues. Mild, wet, windy weather, low pressure driving in off the Atlantic for the first week of December 1938. Looks stormy there on the 5th. More gale force winds, more heavy rain. Absolutely no sign whatsoever of what's going to happen as we get towards Christmas. So that's the 8th of December 1938. Looking again, mild, wet and windy across most parts of the country. That's the 10th again. Low pressure it just continues driving us from off the Atlantic. I doubt anybody at the time would have uh, found this particularly unusual. As I say, we had had since 1895 generally mild or very mild winters with one or two notable exceptions such as winter of 1916, 1917 and the winter of 1928, 1929. They were the very much the exceptions to the rule. Overall, it had been a 45-year period of pretty warm Atlantic driven mild wet and windy uh, winters so this is I'm sure at the time most people thought well here we are this is just another one but we're getting towards the middle of December 1938 uh, now you'll notice a little bit of a change beginning to take place still very unsettled and still mild low pressures out in the middle of the Atlantic churning away there and the ridge of high pressure is to our east. So we're drawing up, we're sucking up those mild southerly winds. And this is starting to move warm air further north than it's been before. The warmth now is starting to pump up into the Arctic. We call this warm air avection, where we get uh, warm air coming out of the tropical Atlantic sometimes and going right the way into the Arctic Circle uh, up here. When that happens, on the eastern side of that push of warmth, cool warm air advection on the eastern side, we start to inflate high pressure. This is a very, very classic example of it. So here's the upper air temperatures on the 14th of December 1938. You can see how warm the upper air temperatures are. They do say they're warm because we're pushing the zero Celsius ice firm up to Iceland, going, uh, and it even happened with zero Celsius ice firm, going up in towards the Arctic. So very, very warm with the upper air temperatures. But notice on the eastern side of that warmth, very cold air is starting to plunge out of Siberia into northern and western parts of Russia. And look what happens then on the 15th of December 1938. It's a classic example of warm air evection starting to build up a ridge of high pressure. We have a 1060 millibar area of high pressure centering itself over Siberia. Not cold yet. We're still in these generally warm southerly southwest winds. But this area of high pressure, this Siberian high, which had been absent for so many years, it would have been a feature in the last Soviet winter of 1895, but we wouldn't have seen that much of it in the intervening 45 years but it's back it's starting to get itself back in business and it's up to 1060 millibars here on the 15th of december now we go through to the 16th of december low pressure again coming in off the atlantic very buoyant atlantic as we know we've had throughout this autumn and into winter so far bringing more gales to the uk but all the time that siberian high is strengthening and pushing its way out of uh, russia and into northeastern parts of europe there's the upper air temperatures on the 16th of December 1938. We're still looking very, very mild with the upper air temperatures, but look at the cold upper air temperatures lurking just to our east. Severely cold, bitter cold, big from the east type cold, although it would have been called that back at the time, is lurking across eastern and northeast parts of Europe. And we get through to the 17th of December 1938, and bam, we're there. The high, the high pressure has pushed out of Siberia into western Russia, and is now moving into Scandinavia. The wind is turning into the east, and much colder air is now beginning to push in from the uh, continent. Upper air temperatures still look reasonably mild for England and Wales anyway, but clearly that cold air that bitterly cold air is surging eastwards from uh, Russia and from Siberia. So Harley writes, consider these midday temperature readings from Kent. On the 16th of uh, December 1938, we get to 12 degrees. But on the 17th of December uh, midday, on this day, therefore, we are at just zero degrees at Kent. 
And then on the 18th of December, the midday temperature was minus 3. On the 19th of December, the midday temperature in Kent was minus 5. And on the 20th of December, the midday temperature was minus 6 degrees. Minus 6 midday maximum temperature in Kent on the 20th of December, 1938. A truly remarkable turnaround. Look at that classic chart of the 18th of December, 1938. Bitter, bitterly cold winds flooding in from off the continent. Upper air temperatures still don't look that cold. It must have been very low level cold to be producing these sub zero maximum temperatures across the east and the southeast. But the true beast is still actually waiting to be unleashed just to our east. And it does mean strikers. This is the 19th of December, 1938, just a few days before Christmas. And here comes the beastly, bringing in those easterly winds and no doubt dragging in with them lots of snow. There's the upper air temperatures. They look really severely cold on the 19th of December, 1938. We're being struck by a true beast heading in from the east. The ten, minus 10 Celsius ice firm is through much of the country. The minus 15 Celsius ice firm is heading into the southeastern corner. And as we get through to the 20th, well, it's, again, it's just going on with that very, very cold, bitterly cold, easterly winds, screaming in those bitter, bitter upper air temperatures. Uh, so the 15 Celsius ice firm now is pushed through most of England and Wales. It's even colder than that. I think the upper air temperatures are getting close to minus 20 degrees down in that southeastern corner. And remember, on this day, uh, with those upper air temperatures, uh, we get a maximum uh, midday temperature in Kent of just minus 6 degrees. You can see why it was so very, very severely cold by how severely cold the upper air temperatures are. Jenna Harley writes, snow fell daily from the 18th of December right the way through to Boxing Day. The 20th, this day, was the coldest uh, day of this particular cold spell. There was particularly heavy snow on the 20th to the 22nd of December, resulting in a snowy Christmas, the best white Christmas of the century, along with 1981, where also uh, more than half the country had snow cover on the ground on Christmas Day. Over 30 centimetres of snow falls across eastern parts of the country, and up to 60 centimetres of snow in the west. So that's interesting, despite the fact this is an easterly wind, you would have thought the east would get the snow more than the west. Actually, it's the west that have more snow, but 60 centimetres there, 30 centimetres is, uh, is enough, though, in the east. This is the 21st of December 1938, again, bringing in these bitterly cold east or northeast wind. Upper air temperatures still not severe, not quite as severe as they are the day before, but no doubt still uh, still sub-zero with the maximum temperatures. A low pressure here is sitting just to our south, so there's energy provided with these east or northeast winds to produce a lot of snow. A little bit more from Trevor. There was skiing on the Chilterns. You can't beat easterly winds, can you, in the winter? The temperature remained uh, freezing from the 18th right way through to Boxing Day at uh, Lipley in Kent with a maximum of only minus 5.6 on the 20th and a maximum of minus 3 widespread across the country on that day too. Minus 15.6 de uh, degrees Celsius was recorded at Braemar on the 22nd. The snow started on the 19th in the southeast and was widespread and heavy across many parts of the country from the 20th to the 21st, causing much disruption. Nice snow, but even back in 1938, snow did cause uh, disruption. More dry snow on Boxing Day, but cover was a foot deep uh, across the south by Boxing Day. So let's get to Christmas. That's how we look on the 23rd, the eve of Christmas Eve. That's how the upper air temperatures look as well. They're not as cold as they were earlier on, but of course we are deeply snow covered now. So though the upper air temperatures aren't as cold, down on the surface, no doubt, it is still well and truly sub-zero and frozen and snow cover with snow cover with the snow laying deep and crisp and even. That's Christmas Eve. So again, high pressure over Scandinavia is still in control of this, where the pattern was still bringing in these cold easterly winds. That's Christmas Day. So probably not a great deal of snow around with that. I would have thought there's probably snow showers peppering 
coastal areas. There's our upper air temperature showing snow showers probably around these northern and eastern coasts. The main thing though is just severely cold under this ridge of high pressure and all of the snow that's fallen on those east and northeasterly winds in the days before. All of that is maintained on the ground. So it is a classic white Christmas from that perspective. And there was snow falling in some parts of the country. That's Boxing Day. So on Boxing Day, we're starting to bring in a weather system from the west. The ridge is beginning to collapse. Still enough of a ridge to keep the very cold weather going across England and Wales. Probably a band of rains, um, maybe it's freezing rain or snow moving in from the west. And this then marks the end of the cold spell. There's the upper air temperatures showing that milder air is starting to move into the north and west of the country, still very cold in the east and the southeast and snow covered. That's the 27th, the Atlantic has now started to break uh, break through. Um, this is when the four begins, so Jeff Harley writes, a four set in on the 27th of December as mild air pushed, uh, pushed away the continental air, and that brings to an end pretty much this remarkable spell of severely cold weather. It only lasts a few days, but given what had happened in the intervening 40 years of the 20th century, uh, I think it was a heads up that something was amiss and things were beginning to change within the atmospheric parameters. That's how we look on New Year's Eve 1938. Low pressure is sitting to the north of Scotland and we're bringing in these northwesterly winds. Still quite cold, actually, with the upper air temperatures. January 1939 is quite an interesting month. Again, not particularly cold. It has a central temperature of 4.2, but it's the second wettest January of the 20th century for England and Wales. And there are also uh, plenty of violent gale force winds. The month cycled between cold and snowy and wet and mild and windy. So you have this dual going on, atmospheric dual going on between generally mild and unsettled weather, but at times pretty cold weather. So the cold weather actually occurs uh, early in the month. So Trevor Harley writes, the 4th of January, 1939, was very cold with a minimum temperature of minus 17 degrees at Darwinie. And that was followed by a maximum there of only minus 6. And it was also down to minus, also got down to minus 15 at Newport in Shropshire uh, in a cold spot on the 6th. So low pressure here through the opening days of January 1939 is moving through the country. Notice the ridge rising up towards Greenland and so we're starting to pull back cold air from the north again. This ridge is associated with the Siberian high that began in the middle of December. So although we did turn milder after Christmas in 1938, we had a four, the overall sort of blocking pattern is still there uh, to quite a large degree. Uh, this is the 4th of January, low pressure is driving in from the Atlantic, so this is going to be bringing heavy rain and heavy snow to many parts of the country. There's the upper air temperature showing cold air is established to northern and eastern parts of the country. And uh, this low pressure then moves across the south, probably brings rain to more southern parts of the country. It would have, bring it, brought, would have brought a dump of snow to central and northern Britain. Four southwards, this low pressure four south, of course, by the ridge. It's not a particularly big ridge, but the ridge is enough uh, sitting over Iceland and back to Greenland to be forcing the jet stream and those areas of low pressure samples. Upper air temperatures aren't especially cold, but it's cold enough for snow, and so that is one of the uh, rain, heavy rain and snow events that occurs during this month. Then we lose all of that, and we get this push of much milder winds coming back up from the southwest, so it shades of what happened in November then, by the 7th of January, much milder air is establishing uh, from the southwest. There's the upper air temperatures showing the mild air setting back in from the Atlantic. The cold air is being pushed away to our east. In terms of the uh, rainfall, Trevor Harley writes, uh, the area between London and Norwich had three times the normal rainfall previous month. There was 128 millimetres of rain at Chelsea, that is 221% of average. Uh, apparently, many lives, unfortunately, were lost on the 23rd, which we get to in a moment, uh, when the St. Ives lifeboat capsized 
off Cornwall. So, again, whether having uh, impacts in terms of uh, unfortunate loss of life. This is the 8th of January, 1939. We're drawing up again this very mild and balmy southwest winds the UK paved in that tropical air from the Azores. That's flattened off by the 10th. And we're going into this uh, much more unsettled and rather cooler spell of weather again. That's the 12. So we've lost that sort of push from the Azores. Now the air is beginning to start digging in from the north again. As we have this ridge beginning to return close to ice of the green. You see how we're swinging, how we're seesawing between warmth and cold. Almost like a jewel. Uh, a jewel of the fates is taking place within the atmosphere. We know where this is going to go in the following winter. But at the moment, just the atmosphere battling it out to see which which of the warm tropical air and which of the Arctic and Siberian air can gain the ascendancy. Looking very stormy now on the 15th of January. What a what a strange winter this is. Very, very stormy conditions. Low pressure just out to our west being severe gale force winds and heavy bouts of rain. And it's really mild again uh, as well. But by the 18th, we've got the low pressure starting to get forced southwards again. The jet stream indicated by black line. That's beginning to drift southwards once again. So the axe is trying to get itself back into a colder pattern, but still these areas of low pressure continue to drive in from off the Atlantic. And this is the one that caused that unfortunate loss of life at St. Tides when the lifeboat capsized. This area of low pressure just here is the culprit, bringing severe gales to some of the western parts of the country. And as that low pressure ex exits away to our east, it begins to pull down these cold winds from the north once again. Here come the upper, the cold upper air temperatures starting to dig back in from the north. And then we've got this low pressure joining the party. On the 25th of January 1939, this low pressure starts to move in from the southwest and this sets up uh, a, a, a snowstorm. Trevor Hardy writes, there was heavy snow on the 25th and 26th of January 1939 in the south with a severe snowstorm, severe snowstorm over high ground in the southwest of England. 50 centimetres of snow falls in Berkshire, Wiltshire and Hants. 35 centimetres of snow falls at Hampstead Heath. Strong winds cause drifting, uh, but further east actually miss out on the snow, so precipitation fell as heavy rain or sleet further east, with 64 millimetres of rain falling near Ipswich. 24 hours of continuous rain at Ipswich lead to the worst floods for 38, 38 years. So just on the margins of this low pressure, on the southern southeastern margins of this low, the air remains warm enough not to snow. But generally, most of this coming in with this area of low pressure is snow. There's the upper air temperatures showing, again, it's not a particularly severely cold upper air temperature, nothing like what we had. Uh, before Christmas in, uh, in the previous year, but it's cold enough, <coughs> it's, excuse me, it is cold enough for snow. And so we have a classic channel low there from the 25th to the 26th. This is uh, about as good as it gets to bring widespread disruptive uh, snowfall and blizzards to lowland southern England. This is what you're looking for, really, with low pressure centred in the channel. There'd be a weather front wrapped around it. I say on the southern southeastern side of the low, air just about warm enough to maintain rain to sleet. But really, for much of England and Wales, and particularly central southern England and Wales, this would have been a tremendous snowstorm. As I say, 50 centimetres of snow fell from this area of low pressure in some places. Uh, there's a minus five Celsius ice firm set, to, set across Wales and Midlands to East Anglia. It can snow to the south of that. Uh, where it definitely can't snow is where we've got the zero Celsius ice firm. Within the zero Celsius and the minus five Celsius ice firm, it just depends on things like uh, the dew points and the margins within the atmosphere. That snowy low then clears away to the south on the 27th and we pull in these bitterly cold east northeast winds. They feed in heavy uh, snow showers once that low uh, sort of uh, clears away. Uh, so Trevor Hardy writes uh, that, uh, uh, that 
Again, snow showers were moving in with these east or northeast winds as the low moved away to the south and southeast. And we get towards the end of January 1939 and high pressure then is sinking down over the country. We're killing off the snow. But and again, a lot of snow is on the ground from the previous uh, snowstorm that occurs around 25th. Um, 26th of January, so it would be very cold at this point with severe overnight frost uh, over that uh, snow cover. Other air temperatures on the last day of January show that warm air is beginning to move in to the south, and that really sets us up then as we go into uh, February. So let's just scroll back shall we for february finally and that's how it begins february 1939 high pressure sitting over to the east of us still pretty cold probably at this point very frosty and of snow cover but by the fur the ridge is beginning to slip away to the south milder air is starting to be drawn up from the south of the southwest trevor harley writes it's a sunny month and it was mild and wet for scotland and the northwest but dry uh, elsewhere has a century temperature of a very mild 5.6. So we're back to the pattern that we had in November, in the first half of November, really, the high pressure beginning to centre itself over the Alps. We're starting to draw up those warm southerly winds, all of the snow melting away, upper air temperatures looking nice and warm. And we just keep this very mild weather going throughout February uh, 1939, really. So, again, we've got these long, fat southwesterly winds pumping up from the tropical Atlantic, keeping those mild conditions going. High pressure often dominating in the south, bringing lots of dry weather there, a little bit more unsettled at times in the north. That's a 20 second. We're having a go at building some high pressure over Scandinavia. It doesn't really come to very much. It does start to turn much more unsettled again late in the month. Uh, these deep areas of low pressure starting to reappear, bring more bouts of heavy rain back with them. Up rare temperatures just lowering uh, a little bit, but overall it's still generally mild. And that attempt to build the ridge over Scandinavia doesn't really come to a great deal. So we end February 1939 looking very mild and unsettled. Into March, we keep those mild, unsettled weather going as well. The 12th does start to try to generate a little bit of a ridge, though, over the UK and going up towards Scandinavia. So having a go, getting the wind back in uh, from the east once again there. Uh, March 1939 has a CET of 5.8, so only 0.2 of a degree uh, warmer in March, actually, than February. Very, very nearly. This March came out colder than February uh, 1939. So Harley writes, this March is a dull month for England and Wales, but sunny for Scotland. Has average temperatures overall, but a cold spell with northeast winds occurs between the 25th and the 29th. It's dry in the southwest, but it's wet in southern Scotland and northeastern parts of England. So there you are on the 18th. Again, having a go at building a ridge from uh, from the UK up to Scandinavia. Cold air is actually digging in across many central and northern parts of Europe. We do pull in the um, minus 10 Celsius ice firm there to parts of England and Wales. That will probably bring snow showers uh, with it. Then it goes a bit milder again. This low pressure dries in on the 22nd. Um, and then start to drag in cold air again from the north. Notice heights rising again over Scandinavia. So cold air is beginning to dig back in. The wind's back into the east on the 26th of March 1939. Cold air digging in from the east. That could well be bringing snow showers back with it to eastern parts of the country. Classic Scandinavian high in East England there on the 28th of March 1939. Of course, by now, we've lost any chance of severe cold digging in from the east, but probably still cold enough for snow showers in eastern parts of the country. And that's how you finish up with March 1939 with high pressure still there over Scandinavia, although the wind is beginning to shift a little bit towards the southwest. So we start to draw up warmer air, milder air, getting to move up from southwest so that is the autumn and winter of 1938-1939 it is a very much a seesaw winter and it's very much a teaser winter now for a teaser winter that does have some very extreme cold it did have some very extreme cold just before christmas but you see the way it was on and off through this winter the atmosphere was trying to decide which way to go. The warmth and the cold were battling it out for ascendancy. 
And as 1939 progressed, of course, we went into the spring and the summer of 1939, that very, very strange summer of 1939, where we was on the cusp of the Second World War and nobody knew which way it was going to go as the political situation got more and more uh, more and more serious through that summer. But the weather uh, went into rather a quieter mode through the spring and summer of 1939. But then as we got into the autumn and the winter of 1939-1940, that is when we finally started to lock in something much, much more severely cold. And I suppose at that point, uh, we've got to continue the story, haven't we? So I can tell you now that this video has been setting up what we're going to do next. So this is kind of like up the prologue. And what we're planning to do is over the next three um, historic videos, which is going to be Christmas Day, Easter Monday, and finally um, May Day, Bank Holiday Monday next year, we're going to release a trilogy of historic weather videos looking at those trilogy of severe winters, the, the three severe winters that occurred through the early 1940s. So we begin on Christmas Day. I can tell you right now, the Christmas Day historic weather video will be looking at winter of 1939-1940. And then we will, uh, on, the, on Easter Monday, we will have a look at the uh, severe winter of 1940-1941. And then we will finish uh, this trilogy of videos uh, on May Day Bank Holiday Monday, looking at the severe winter of 1941-1942, the last of the trilogy. So that's what this video has been all about, really. I didn't tell you about it at the start, but I'm telling you it now at the end. It is kind of like the prologue to our trilogy of videos that we've got coming up uh, on Christmas Day, on Easter Monday, and on May Day, Bank Holiday Monday. We will be looking at the three severe cold winters of the early 1940s. So, first one of those is going to be on Christmas Day. And I can tell you that right now, I can tell you right now, that is going to be looking at the winter of 1939-1940. The first winter of the Second World War. And actually the coldest, uh, most severest of the three cold and severe 19, early 1940s winters. Right, we've talked for 50 minutes. Hope you found it interesting and fun. Thanks so much, so, so much for tuning in on your late August bank holiday Monday. I'm blown away that people want to spend a bit of time with us on their late, uh, on their um, on their bank holidays, uh, be it late summer or, or whatever bank holiday it is through the year. Uh, if you haven't been able to watch this video all in one go, I'm going to place it within the historic section at Gaza. This is given its own page. That'll be later on today. Also later on today, we've got Terry Scholes' autumn forecast coming up. So that could be a pretty interesting read. I'll get that up for you late this afternoon or early this evening. Uh, and at 52 minutes, it's time to sign off. So again, thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, if you enjoy these historic web videos, then please give us a like, give us a thumbs up and let us know in the comments if you're enjoying it and we'll see you i suppose on christmas day for the 1939-1940 uh winter historic weather video but that's all for now and thanks for watching